Welcome everybody. We're going to um, wait for a few minutes while while everyone gets uh, joined into the conference. We're just waiting as people uh, people get joined into the conference. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. We're gonna wait just a minute while everyone joins. So um, while we wait for a few more people to join, um, we'll just point out a couple of things about um, about using the the Zoom webinar um, that we're that we're hosting today's meeting on. Um, first, to adjust your audio settings in the lower left hand corner of the screen, there should be a button that allows you to click and see a menu. Second. Um, if you want to submit questions to the panelists at the at the center bottom of the screen, uh, there's a button that says click here to submit questions to the panelists. And those are those can be typed into the into the um, chat bar there so that they show up for us. And then the last thing is that um, to change your viewing options, you can click on the view button in the upper right hand corner. And this is a place where you might swap the slides and the speaker um, view so that you, you can see the slides bigger or you can see the speaker uh, uh, bigger and the slides smaller. Fairly, you know, fairly standard if you've been on these Zoom webinars before, but, but not always intuitive if you, if you haven't been. Okay. Um, I'm sure there will be more people joining uh, as we go along. But I think it's reasonable to get, get started now. We're incredibly excited to have the seventh annual ALS Your Day um, this year. <clears throat> Once again, we're virtual. We're looking forward to when we can do this in person. It's a wonderful uh, community building event, but we're also excited to share some of the remarkable breakthroughs that we've seen in ALS over the last uh, year or so. I think we have um, many of the people from our clinic here today um, we are all really just thrilled at the, the data we have to share, as well as some of the projects that are ongoing and upcoming. And um, with that, we'll get started. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Merit Sakovich, the director of the Sean M. Healy and AMG Center for ALS and the chief of neurology here at Mass General Hospital. And Merit's going to give us a, an introduction to the day. Oops, you're on mute. Now. I'm sorry. <laughs> trying to unmute and let me share again. So hopefully you can all see that. So thank you, James, and, and welcome everybody to our seventh annual care and research symposium. Uh, it's a rainy day here, uh, but we're really um, excited to share um, what we're working on, but also all the progress we see in the field and the collaboration really made possible by, um, by uh, the center. Um, and a special thanks again to um, Sean Healy and AMG and all the other people who have helped us create the center so that we can provide the best care and the best access to uh, research. 
um, uh, to everybody with ALS. So I'm just going to um, highlight a few things and then turn uh, the podium over to my colleagues. Yeah, so today, um, uh, Dr. Babu will give us um, some breakthrough results on treatments in the, in the horizon. Uh, Jen and Scalia will uh, talk to us about the care team and some innovation there. Uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Dr. Barry and Dr. Nicholson about some of the, the new initiatives coming by, and we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, for Q&A. Um, so I know a lot of you come to our weekly calls about the platform trial, but not everybody knows about this. And I do want to share because this is one of the, um, uh, I think, most innovative initiatives that we've launched at the center the last uh, two years um, to try to really accelerate how treatments are brought forward to people with ALS. And um, in particular, how we can get effective treatments on the market for everybody. This approach called a platform trial is very different than how trials were traditionally done where one treatment was tested at a time. Uh, instead here, we test multiple treatments in the same infrastructure and we keep going until we find effective treatments. And this approach has been used in cancer and other fields and has been shown that when you have a big pipeline of treatments to test, doing a platform trial can cut the time in half to get an effective treatment, cuts the cost by a third, and it greatly reduces the number of people who are on what we call placebo or the flip, it really greatly increases the number of people who get active drug during the double bind period. So we thought about two years ago that ALS was right for this type of approach because the pipeline was so big. I, many of you have heard me say 160 companies is actually now up to over 250 large and small companies are working on ALS. That's just outstanding. If you had looked at that number you know, a couple of years ago, it would be you know, a contingent with two hands. So it, it, and that is being driven by the science and the need. Um, and so that is a real good setup for the platform trial where again, we test multiple drugs in the same um, structure uh, rather than one at a time. So we started with four drugs. Um, and uh, these are the four drugs um, that we started with. And we did a, a global competition to pick what we thought were the best treatments out there. And the WE was really a, a group of scientists from our Northeast ALS Consortium and from the Healy Center Science Advisory Board. And in this trial, uh, people are, um, who wanna be part of the trial are randomized to one of the four drugs. And then again, randomized three to one active drug versus placebo. So that 75% of people are given the active drug during the double blind period, which is six months, 25% placebo. And then after the six months, everybody has the option to go into what's called an open label extension where everybody gets the active drug. And the, the economy of scale and the time savings are uh, from a couple of things. One is that we share the data from the people on placebo from each of the regimens. So we pull that and they're used for the analysis for each of the drug. And that can, um, again, save a lot of, of time and really reduce the number of people on placebo. In addition, when we wanna add a drug, instead of starting all over again, we just amend this protocol. And that can take, um, it's taken for regimen uh, D, it took nine days for um, ethics approval to add a drug. And then for regimen uh, E, which we're, gonna, we're about to um, add, it took 11 days. Now the, the FDA still wants 30 days, um, but still that's much, much faster than if you start a, a drug, a, a single drug, which can often take 12 months. So that's a huge time savings, which as we know um, is really critical in this illness. So I just wanna give an update that we are almost done enrolling the first four treatments for this. Uh, we're aiming for 160 approximately in each arm. As you can see, we're very close with regimen A, B, and C, um, and regimen D is almost done as well. And so that's really a testimony to all, all of you and many, many other people with ALS who have been very supportive and involved in this initiative from day one and have helped get the word out and get enrollment um, to be uh, really faster than any any trial. So thank you for that. So um, with this timeline, we anticipate having the results for this, these four drugs uh, end of spring, early summer next year. Now we do have interim analysis along the way, and that's really important as we're always having a safety committee looking at the data along the way. I'll just say that pharma interest is high. We've had 62 companies talk to us, 33 officially apply. We've actually selected nine. We're working with a couple. So people get that this is an important way to, to test treatments in, in ALS. Along the way, our, our, our patient advisory committee really recommended that we build a parallel expanded access program. And again, a huge thanks to the 
the Healy family and AMG and many, many, many of our patients and other people who have um, uh, donated so that we could provide expanded access to people. Expanded access is another name for compassion use. This is a way to give the same experimental treatments that are in trials to people who might not be eligible for trials for a variety of reasons. And we started a program at Mass General uh, two years ago, and we've now actually enrolled 133 people in our expanded access program, uh, 10 different drugs. And now we're expanding this to other centers uh, in the platform trials. So uh, we're adding three new multi-center expanded access programs at eight centers. We have another 10 centers that are interested and want to be part of this. And I think eventually our goal is that every center is uh, offering this for their patients who cannot be in the trials. It's really um, an important step forward. And I know there's a lot of um, legislation and lobbying to get um, even some uh, federal funding for this type of approach. This is just a quick list uh, to show that, um, you know, it, it's, they're vary in size. Some of our expanded access are just one participant. Some are 40 or 30. That's, uh, but we, we try to really meet uh, people with what they would like to do. And we also have a couple people who are, uh, live internationally who are in our expanded access program. Um, so if you don't know Judy, Catherine, and Allison, I hope you do get to meet with them. They are um, amazing uh, people and uh, have good hearts, and they are here to help you uh, or anyone uh, with ALS find the right trial for them. We didn't really, I would say, need this role maybe five years ago. We need it now a lot because there's so many trials out there. And it's, it can be daunting to go through the list and know what might be right for you. So Judy Carey is a research nurse who helps people with that, that and Catherine Small and Allison Balat help um, first on the platform trial, but then also can answer questions really about any trial. We have a weekly webinar, uh, please join us. Um, and uh, we love them and we get great questions and it's a great way to dialogue together. I also just wanted to point out in my last minutes that it's really important that we keep attracting the youngest and the smartest, or maybe the smartest and the youngest people to go into this field. Um, and uh, and uh, so to do that, um, we partnered with ALS Finding Cure to fund um, four young investigators um, who are developing um, targets, new targets and new treatments for people with ALS, where they spend the first year and a half in their mentor lab, no matter where they are in the, in the world, um, and then in their last six months of this two-year fellowship, yeah, we place them in a company so that they can learn drug development from an industry pharma perspective as well, because we need those partnerships and, the, and those understandings. There's some things academics do well, there's many things um, you know, pharma does well, and we need to be partnering. So these are our first four um, uh, scholars. And uh, also, uh, we're just very fortunate to have a, a rich pipeline of young investigators at Mass General who come and work with us in the trials as well as in the labs. And again, we have uh, four different uh, fellowships here so that we can keep uh, bringing in, again, the youngest and smartest and get them excited about ALS because we need, we need always new ideas and new people. And that's part of our role is to mentor them and, and, um, and uh, have them um, find the same passion that all of us have to find cures for this illness. So lastly, I, I, we're really honored that the Frady's family asked us and AMG to take over the, the annual Pete Frady's 5K run uh, and for um, the funds raised from that to go to our house call program. And uh, so uh, the race is kind of hybrid. People can uh, run it uh, virtually or walk it virtually or, um, uh, or, or go in person. But the next one is November 7th. Um, and uh, also uh, a beer place is giving um, uh, a beer in honor of the Ice Bucket Challenge and Pete Frady's as well. Um, so uh, hopefully the, it won't be as rainy and dark as it is today, uh, next week. So uh, thank you for that. And I'll, I'll turn the um, Zoom back over to uh, Dr. Barry and Dr. Babu. Thank you so much, Merit. It's just, a, what a great start to the, to the day. Um, Suma Ababu is going to um, uh, speak next to give updates on the Tofersen trial for SOD1 ALS. Uh, Suma is an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. She's been leading these trials and doing a huge amount of work as well as leading other trials and um, leading a whole program in imaging in, in ALS. Suma, we're really excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you, James. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. 
I'm excited to present the results of the Valor study, the phase three study of tofersin for uh, people with SOD1 ALS. As many of you might know that the results of this Biogen sponsored trial was announced about two weeks ago. And today we'll recapitulate the highlights of the results of uh, the phase three study. These are my disclosures. I've received research funding from um, foundations as well as uh, from industry. So in terms of the top line results of the phase three um, trial, the Valor study was a mixed bag of good news and bad news. Um, so the primary endpoint ALS FRSR um, that was uh, selected as the predetermined primary endpoint for this um, trial um, did not meet statistical significance. Having said that, there were several promising signals of stabilization of clinical function, respiratory function, and muscle strength seen in participants treated um, either longer in the open label extension, had early access to tofersin, as well as in the slow progressing individuals. Um, overall, tofersin was um, noted to be safe and tolerable, um, but five out of a total of 108 participants uh, uh, experienced uh, at least one serious neurological side effect. Um, and in addition to the clinical promising signals, um, in, the study also showed favorable and um, significant reduction in some of the biomarkers, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit um, as well. All the data that I'm going to present uh, in this presentation today are available on the Biogen's website. So I've given the link uh, at the, on the slide below, so feel free to download the, the data and, and take a look if you're interested. So first of all, what is SOD1 ALS? What is tofersin and how does that work? SOD1 ALS is a rare form of ALS. It accounts for about 2% of all cases of, of ALS. It's a genetic form of ALS where there's a genetic mutation in the SOD1 gene, which results in overproduction of um, SOD1 protein, which becomes toxic in the motor neuron environment, leading to damage and neurodegeneration and, and causing the, the ALS disease. So Fersin is an experimental medication that targets that faulty mRNA and uh, like a lock and key and blocks the overproduction of this toxic SOD1 protein and hence rescues the motor neurons from degenerating. And, and the thought is that this mechanism would help to slow the disease progression um, in people who are affected by SOD1 ALS. Valor study was a phase three uh, clinical trial testing tofersin in people with SOD1 ALS. Let's look at the study design of uh, the study and the recruitment numbers as well. So in the study, um, a, a total of 108 participants um, uh, with SOD1 ALS were enrolled and randomized to receive tofersin at 100 milligram dosage versus placebo at a two to one ratio over a 28 week treatment period. All participants who completed the placebo control portion had the opportunity to roll over into the open label extension. And this open label extension study is still ongoing um, as of today, uh, where everybody receives 100 milligram dosage of tofersin, regardless of their initial treatment assignment in the placebo control portion. Now, in the study, participants were uh, stratified into fast and slow progressing uh, groups based on, based on their genetic variants within the SOD1 gene, as well as based on the estimated uh, pre-slope or rate of decline in a questionnaire, the ALS FRSR functional rating scale questionnaire scores um, prior to study enrollment. So several measures were um, several outcomes were measured in the study uh, during um, uh, during the study participation, and uh, the outcomes were compared at the end of that 28 week treatment period. Um, what was predetermined to be the primary outcome for this trial was the uh, ALS FRSR, uh, which I'm, uh, many of you may be familiar with. It's a 12 point questionnaire that asks about uh, various different limb and bulbar function, respiratory function. And among the secondary outcomes, um, uh, um, several measures, including breathing scores, muscle strength, biomarkers, such as the SOD1 protein levels itself, neurofilament levels were measured. Um, and we'll talk about um, more uh, about these biomarkers in just a little bit, as well as their markers of target engagement, as well as neurodegeneration. So this slide shows the primary endpoint results of this trial. Uh, there were no statistically significant um, slowing in that ALS FRSR questionnaire sc um, score um, change over 28 week time period. 
which I, as I mentioned before, was uh, predetermined as a primary endpoint. Um, on this graph here, we're, what we're looking for in this graph are group differences over that 28 week treatment duration between to first and treated as well as uh, placebo treated groups. Um, you are looking at two sets of colored groups. The red line indicates fast progressors and the blue line indicates the slow progressors. And within each color, you're seeing a dotted line and a solid line. The solid line indicates participants who received the first in and the dotted lines indicate participants who received placebo. Now, in general terms, better efficacy for a drug uh, would be interpreted by less steep of uh, the solid curve um, over time and wider separation between the solid and dotted lines within each color. As you can see in this figure for this primary endpoint, there was no notable separation between the solid and dotted lines over the 28 week period, indicating lack of that statistical significance on the ALS FRSR over the 28 period. And within each group, the fast and the slow progressing groups, the, the total number of participants um, that were enrolled in each group is given at the bottom of the slide. Um, so 39 to first and versus 24 placebo in the fast progressing group, and 33 to first and versus um, 15 placebo in the slow progressing group. In the graph above, as well as in the table below, you'll see that as expected, fast progressors shown in red font dropped far more points on the ALS FRSR scale compared to the slow progressors shown in blue font. But when you look across each of these fonts, you'll see that there were no significant differences in number of points dropped by to first and treated groups versus placebo treated groups over the 28 week period. Now, if you focus on um, the second table on the right, which measures the ALS FRSR score decline over longer durations beyond the 28 week period into the open label extension. And then if uh, for a moment, uh, shift your focus on the blue font, the, sl uh, the slow progressing group, uh, you'll see that individuals who received to first and from the get go declined only by two points over that 76 um, week treatment duration uh, compared to the uh, compared to double the amount seen in individuals who initially received placebo and then received to first and in the open label extension for the same 76 week duration. Due to the rapid progressing nature of the fast progressors, the data goes all, uh, only up to 40 weeks and there was no notable differences between the early start to first and versus the placebo rolling over to the to first and groups in the open label extension. Now, this is a slide looking at the SOD1 protein biomarker levels. As I mentioned before, um, SOD1 protein is um, uh, overproduced in this form of ALS, leading to toxicity and motor neuron degeneration. Um, so a drug like tofersin, if it lowers SOD1 protein, it would indicate that the drug is able to shake hands with the target that it is supposed to shake hands with, and it actually is doing what it's supposed to do in terms of lowering that SOD1 protein level. And when we look at this data here, um, what is highlighted in the green box, um, there is a 29% reduction in SOD1 protein levels into first and treated fast progressing group. And compare that to placebo group, there was actually a 16% increase in the SOD1 protein levels during the 28 week period. Similarly, when we look at the slow progressing group, there was a 40% decrease in the SOD1 protein levels. Uh, into first and treated compared to only a 19% decrease in the placebo treated group. And when we look at the neurofilament levels, this is another um, um, biomarker that is um, increasingly used in clinical trials in ALS. It's not specific for ALS, it's a marker of neurodegeneration. Um, higher levels indicate ongoing neurodegeneration. In general, neurofilament levels, and, um, levels are increased uh, at the time of onset of uh, symptoms and they remain elevated in ALS patients throughout uh, the disease duration. And neurofilament is really a protein that is leaked uh, into the spinal fluid and blood and comes from uh, nerves and nerve cells when the nerve or nerve cell is damaged. So, so first then in this study, uh, significantly lowered the neurofilament levels, both in the fast and the slow progressing uh, groups. 
Um, and uh, on this graph, you know, lower uh, lines will indicate um, greater reduction in neurofilaments, which also means uh, lesser neurodegeneration. So as you can see, the solid lines are clearly below uh, compared to the dotted lines that are above, indicating that the person was able to slow the rate of neurodegeneration uh, based off of this biomarker. Um, the effect on respiratory function. So, uh, so first, there was a trend towards benefit in stabilizing the respiratory function in slow progressors uh, who were exposed to first and early, um, though it did not meet statistical significance in this study. Overall, to first then, it was observed to be safe and well tolerated. Um, uh, most of the side effects were mild to moderate related to lumbar punctures because the drug is given intrathecally through spinal taps. And um, majority of participants uh, experienced varying levels of increase in spinal fluid protein and white cell counts, though most, most patient participants remained asymptomatic to these increases. About five participants out of the total of 108 participants experienced at least one serious neurological side effect, uh, such as inflammation of the spinal cord or inflammation of the nerve roots or inflammation of the meninges. Um, uh, and one participant experienced raised uh, spinal, spinal fluid pressures. So to, to summarize again, I think this is a mixed bag of good news, bad news. Um, and um, uh, even though the primary endpoint uh, was not statistically significant, there are several secondary endpoints and biomarkers which have shown favorable results and, and uh, really brings hope and promise um, for the community um, in terms of drug development, uh, targeted drug development for genetic forms of ALS. So the current status of this study, um, we are currently waiting for FDA's review and decision on uh, what the next steps would be in terms of uh, approval uh, or not for um, photofersin uh, based off of this trial data. Um, in the meantime, the open label extension, uh, which has been ongoing for a few years now, continues um, on. And more recently, the open label extension is further expand, uh, extended from four and a half years to almost close to seven years of access to first and for participants who are in the study. And uh, very recently, an expanded access program is also launched and Biogen is uh, providing access to first and for um, participants with SOD1 ALS through the expanded access program. And uh, this is available um, at MGH as well as uh, patients can also uh, request access of to first in, um, through their local neurologist office um, as well. Um, and uh, of, uh, of, co of course, we are happy to um, help Help, uh, patients at MGH as well as happy to help um, your local neurologist um, uh, uh, with uh, the next steps on how to uh, request for the top person access. So please consult with your neurologist if you think this is the right approach um, for you. Um, and uh, I'll end by really extending a deep gratitude to all our SOD1 ALS participants and families who have um, supported, who've participated and uh, promoted research of the SOD1 ALS um, a trial at MGH for several years now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Suma. That was fabulous. <clears throat> um, you know, um, some complex results there, lots of trends in the right direction, remarkable biomarker results. So, you know, I think there's, there's um, just so much to be learned. And, and um, really exciting that, that, that the open label extension goes on. We continue to get more data and the expanded access is available. Um, uh, next, um, next to talk about some other, other really incredible results is uh, Dr. Sabrina Paganoni, co-director of the, the Neurological Clinical Research Institute, um, assistant professor uh, at Harvard Medical School, lead of the CENTAR trial that she's gonna talk about um, and, and uh, co-PI of the platform trial and really leading that to incredible successes as well. Sabrina, we're, we're overjoyed to have you here. Looking forward to, to, to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I'm gonna share my slides. And welcome everyone. I recognize many familiar names on the attendee list. So it's great to see you for this webinar and for the people I don't know, welcome. And it's a pleasure to, to have you uh, today and hopefully we'll meet in person soon. So, so today I will share the newest updates on AMX35. And I previously presented the details of the trial data. So rather than repeating that today, what I'm gonna do is to focus on what's new, why it matters to you and how you can get involved. 
So first of all, I want to start by sharing that um, the uh, center trial was a fantastic collaboration with the ALS community. The trial was designed and coordinated by the Healy and AMG Center for ALS here at Mass General in partnership with 25 other academic centers, the NIST Consortium, the ALS Association, ALS Finding a Cure, Amelix Pharmaceuticals, and our patient advisors. So big thanks to everyone who was part of this trial. In the center trial, which was a phase two trial, uh, we evaluated the effect of AMX35 on physical function that was measured over a six month period. We also tested the effect of AMX35 on survival that was assessed long-term up to three years. And throughout all of this, we also monitored the safety of AMX35. And very quickly, I'm gonna summarize the results. In the center trial, administration of AMX35 resulted in a functional benefit. This means that the participants who started on AMX35 had slower disease progression than people who started on placebo. I, I want to clarify that AMX35 did not stop and did not reverse the disease. However, it did make a significant difference in terms of rate of progression and retention of physical function. Next, when we followed participants long-term, we saw that the participants who started on AMX35 lived significantly longer than those who started on placebo, and the difference was at least 6.5 months. And finally, in the trial, the drug was overall safe and well-tolerated. A minority of people who participated in the trial had gastrointestinal side effects. Now, one thing that we're very, very proud of is that the clinical data and plasma samples from the center trial were donated to the ALS uh, scientific community. And this is important because it means that center trial data will be shared freely with researchers worldwide. And that's important to help advance ALS science, help design new trials, and discover new biomarkers. All of these shared resources are managed by the Helian AMG Center here at Mass General in collaboration with many academic partners and foundations. They are listed on the slide and they all participate uh, in this, um, you know, in, in the funding of these resources, which is fantastic, so that uh, everything we do, we really want to amplify the impact of uh, by sharing the data, the samples, so that we can learn even more from uh, everyone's participation in the trial. Now, let me now switch gears and tell you about what's new. So what's new is that recently, Amelix uh, announced the intention to submit a new drug application, also known as NDA, to the FDA. And that's based on center data. So that means that the data that we obtained in center uh, can really support a new drug for ALS, or at least the submission, the, the request to approve uh, a new drug for ALS. So let me share the current information on timeline. So what we do know is that Amelix will submit a new drug application with the FDA for AMX35 for the treatment of ALS. What we don't know is if the submission will be accepted how long the review will take. And, and then ultimately what we don't know is whether AMX35 will be approved for ALS. So while the review is in pro progress, uh, what options do we have? So what are the options to get access to AMX35 while this process continues? Well, the most direct way to uh, have access to AMX35, the, the product that was tested in the center trial, is to consider participation in the Phoenix trial. Now, the Phoenix trial is a phase three trial um, that will start enrolling soon to supplement the clinical development uh, program of AMX35. Now, you may wonder, why do we need another trial if there is an FDA submission in, in process? Well, the problem is that while the company will submit the data from the previous phase two center trial, this is just the first step in the process and does not guarantee that the drug will be approved. So that's why it's important to gather even more data in the Phoenix trial to really maximize the chances of success. In addition, the Phoenix trial will enroll a larger population, a broader population with longer follow-up, and we will collect a more comprehensive set of uh, outcome and biomarker data. In other words, we will learn even more about the effects of AMX35 while the NDA is in progress, which will be important because we want to learn as much as possible about this drug 
so that in the future, when we have discussions in the clinic, we can answer more questions and have an informed discussion with our patients uh, to, to discuss uh, you know, the, the, the granular effects of AMX35 on a variety of outcomes. So if and when AMX35 is approved, the Phoenix trial will have contributed additional important data. Now, I do want to mention that the Phoenix trial will open soon at several locations. This is a global trial. It will happen in the US as well as Europe. It will also open at MGH. Now, there are some key eligibility criteria that I'm listing on the slide here. So to participate, people need to uh, have ALS uh, defined as definite or probable ALS by ls Corel criteria. Your physician can explain uh, whether you, you, um, your, uh, your presentation uh, is within these categories. People need to have had the disease for less than two years and their vital capacity, which is a measure of respiratory function, needs to be at least 55% uh, of, predicted, of predicted. Now, for more information, please talk to your ALS care team, contact us at the Healy Center. Again, um, the trial will be enrolling soon with, with Dr. Barry as SIPI, uh, so there will be options at MGH. Now, let me summarize what, what I said so far. So uh, as, as, as I just described, a new drug application or NDA for AMX35 for the treatment of ALS will be submitted to the FDA very soon. This means that if the, uh, re, uh, the application is accepted and reviewed favorably by the FDA, we could have a new drug for ALS in 2022. But we don't know if that's gonna happen or what the exact timelines uh, will be because they depend on FDA review. So in the meantime, uh, options to get access to AMX35 include enrollment in the Phoenix phase three trial, which will open soon, including at FGH. Now, I do want to uh, obviously acknowledge that uh, even if we're excited to have the, uh, the, the Phoenix phase three trial, we also recognize that not everyone can participate in the trial because for every trial, there are inclusion and exclusion criteria. I just described the key ones for Phoenix and, and not everyone who might want to participate can actually enroll because of the eligibility criteria. Now, for this reason, an expanded access program is in the planning stages for people who cannot participate in Phoenix. Now, this program is probably gonna be on the smaller size, but uh, nevertheless, we're excited that the company decided to uh, launch this EAP alongside the trial. We don't know the exact sample size yet or the exact launch date yet. We're working closely with the company uh, on finalizing the last few details. And then we plan on sharing updates by the end of 2021. So, uh, so thank you so much for all your participation and all your interest. I would suggest that you, um, if you're interested in this drug development program, obviously you can contact me uh, anytime. Uh, uh, feel free to also talk with your ALS care team or contact us uh, on this slide. Uh, I have the contact information for Judy Carey, I'm sure. Most of you know Judy already. Uh, she's our wonderful ALS research access nurse. And if you have questions about enrolling in the program at MGH, please reach out to, to Judy. And, and to end, I really would like to uh, thank uh, everyone who participated in the center trial. Uh, really, this was an amazing community collaboration I want to thank Dr. Sukovic, the senior author of this uh, trial, uh, who really had the idea first to, uh, to bring uh, this, this drug to, to ALS. So work closely with the company uh, to initiate this trial. So thank you, uh, thank you everyone and, and, and have to take your questions. Um, uh, incredibly exciting results. <clears throat> you know, we just don't get to, to see these kind of results as often as we'd like. I think that we'll see them more and more in, in upcoming years. So this is sort of a, hopefully just a trend setting a trial. Really excited to get going on, on the Phoenix trial and, and see those re results uh, replicate as well and, and see what happens at the FDA. Thank you so much. Before we get to a kind of a formal Q&A, although you're, you know, anyone is, is welcome to enter questions into the, the Q&A box at any time. Um, we're gonna have one more presentation. This is from uh, Jen Scalia who's the Associate Director for the ALS Multidisciplinary Clinic and also Director of Innovation and Integration at the NCRI, Care Innovation and Integration at the NCRI, and Sarah Lupino, who's the Associate Site Director of Research for the NCRI at Mass General Hospital as well. And they'll be talking about the care team, integration of research and clinical care, and then some about care delivery modalities uh, in the era of COVID-19 as well. 
Great, thank you, James. I'm just gonna share my screen. I'm just gonna do it a slightly different way. Here we go. Thank you, Sarah. So we are, uh, I'm Jen and this is Sarah. Uh, and as James mentioned, we both are in clinic and research uh, with, our, with different hats. Um, in the clinic, I'm the associate clinic director and Sarah is the associate research site director, but Sarah, we're both nurse practitioners. We're both helping in both areas. So it's uh, wonderful to come to you today to present on integrating um, uh, clinic and research and the innovation that we are doing. And just as kind of a, a reminder, you know, despite the last year and a half of COVID and the pandemic, we are very much still here for you. I'm working as hard as ever and uh, very dedicated to finding more answers, better answers, and helping uh, people who are currently going having ALS and their family. Uh, we're here in lots of different ways, phone, email, patient gateway, webinars, um, and completely dedicated to, to you. And so we're we are here, though you might not see us in person quite as much. <laughs> so who are we uh, as the MGH clinic, ALS clinic? Uh, we are a lot of different disciplines that come together with the people of ALS and the families affected by ALS at the center. And while we all come from different backgrounds and different trainings, uh, we all are giving individualized care to help to help you. And some of us are physically in the clinic for when you come into in-clinic visits. Uh, some of us are more remote, but can always come in person uh, if we to arrange ahead of time, if, if that's helpful. Uh, always physically in the clinic are the providers, the physicians, nurse practitioners, the registered nurses, speech and swallowing therapists, physical therapists, and also our research coordinators are there helping with breathing tests and the ALS FRS questionnaire and just to help general navigation of clinic. Um, though we have many other people involved in our clinic that are have, especially in recent times, been conducting things more remotely, though we have also arranged for them to see people in person if that's more convenient, or it just requires a little planning ahead of time. So Julie McLean, who's the occupational therapist who helps uh, with our clinic. We do have to schedule with her ahead of time, uh, but we can do that and arrange for it to be on the same day with just a little bit of planning. And uh, same thing with Paris, our respiratory therapist, or Kate Brizzy, who's our uh, physician who's in neuropalliative care. She's a neurologist, but also trained in palliative care, and she collaborates with us. Um, our Parenting at a Challenging Time, also known as the PAC team, uh, is largely remote now, and we've had a lot of feedback that that's been actually more helpful remote, though we've also asked for them to come in to see people in clinic if that's helpful. And our psychiatry and counseling services, we have some people that we have worked um, closely, more closely with in uh, the last year or so. And they've been mostly remote, um, not as much in person. Genetic counseling can also be both remote and in person. So really trying to tailor it to you so that if it makes sense for you to see these disciplines in person that we're there for you. Otherwise you can help do it remote, which is sometimes a bit easier, but there's a lot of us. Um, you might not need to see all of us all the time or ever even, um, but when you do come, we're happy to whoever needs to be there to help you come together to help you the best we can. Everything is always personalized. So that's why each clinic visit might be a little bit different person to person and visit to visit but we are really focused on figuring out what ALS means to you and, and what's important to you. Uh, I've been here for um, thir over 13 years now and it never ceases to amaze me the different stories that I hear. I really enjoy hearing everyone's stories and it really highlights that ALS is different for everybody. Um, what's important to you just as a person is different. And that means that the care has to be different person to person. And we really focus on trying to deliver that for you. So what do we do a little, and, you know, if we were to really iron it out a little bit more specifically, um, we do, uh, as depending different members of the teams do different pieces of this, but there's, we diagnose ALS, there are mimics of ALS and the 
uh, physicians that work in our clinic are have many years training so that they can help differentiate and run tests to figure out if this is ALS or something different. I have also seen our physicians double check on things a year later, something feels a little different or they read a different research article and more information comes out. Oh, never stopping to look for other answers or different answers while also treating you with all the information we have now. Um, aggressive symptom management to improve outcomes. And sometimes it's symptom management that might not be as aggressive. It's just what is helpful to you, um, whether that's helping to set you up with a brace to help your, you know, play golf right now, or to something like a high tech communication device that might be, we need to plan further in advance because it can take some time to, to figure out how to get it and to get it. But we're there for you um, to figure out what the best solutions are for the symptoms that you are having, because everybody does have different symptoms in a different order. We also provide lots of education, both about the clinic, clinical things, symptoms, ALS as a whole, and also on research. Sometimes it's more general, what is research? What's, what does it mean, a phase one, phase two study? Um, and sometimes it's what is this drug or this supplement and what is this looking like in the ALS world. And there's lots of education about how that happens in the ALS clinic. You don't need to be involved in research to, to hear about that and to learn about that. Uh, and our, our group also tries to uh, stay very up to date on these therapies and also provide access to the FDA approved therapies. A couple of years ago, Radicava was approved for ALS and that definitely changed how we delivered um, that therapy because that's not quite as simple. And there's a lot more hoops to jump through with um, needing venous access and insurance companies having a bit more hoops. But we are dedicated to providing access to the therapies that, um, that are approved for ALS and that's right for you. Not every therapy might be right for each person. Uh, we also uh, refer and connect to different resources in the hospital and your local communities. Sometimes this means I'm on the phone or a team member is on the phone with your primary care to help you know, provide information, decide if this medication right, or we're noticing this. I don't think this is related to ALS, but let's come together on this symptom. Uh, sometimes it's connecting you with a, a group, one of the nonprofits that we work with, like Compassionate Care ALS, the MDA, uh, ALS Association. Or if you're somebody who lives further away, we, you know, we see people across the United States uh, in the world. And some people will have a local ALS provider and also see us, which is okay too. Uh, if you don't live close to us, it is good to have a team, whether it be an ALS team or a primary care provider that knows you very well and can help you if something were to come up overnight. And we are always happy to connect, connect you to somebody or work with them uh, to help deliver you the best care. So whether you're here or you're in somebody else's office, we're, we're there for you. I will say one other thing that we do that's not on this slide is something that Dr. Spikovich mentioned in that first presentation, which is uh, truly helping to teach the next generation of ALS workers. Uh, our research coordinators that are helping in the research studies, but also doing conducting uh, vital capacities and questionnaires in clinic are many times going off to nursing school or medical school or, or PhD, and they're learning about ALS. We also, uh, teach the next generation of physicians who already have their MDs or doctorates or their PhDs currently. And also we've done had nursing students or had other uh, different specialties shadow so that they know about ALS, whether they specialize in ALS as when they come through the rest of their schooling or whether they go and do something else but now have a lot more information on ALS so that it's, there's more knowledge out there. And we are con continuously undergoing process improvement, anything we can do to help deliver care better for you. Uh, we do, we have had in-person clinics for a long time now. Something newer to this in-person clinic is our primary team model, where there's a physician, a nurse practitioner, and a registered nurse that creates your primary team. So you are seeing the same MD, NP, and RN. Many times the MD and NP will alternate visits, so you're not seeing them on the same time, so those um, visits alternate. 
But now there's two providers that know you better and are coming to, together from different disciplines and can help if something urgent comes up, it's more likely that somebody is able to jump and help jump talk to your primary care or see you inpatient when the team needs help or information on you to better to better help you as a person since everyone is different. And having that MD, NP, RN that know you through your entire time with us, it's been really nice to just be, be continuous and get to know you and your family and what's important to you and where you vacation, because as we get to know you better, we can help you better and deliver better care for you. In addition to our in-person clinics and our house call program, which is run by Deb Skinnicky, who's a nurse practitioner, and Kristen Kingsley, who's an RN, there is only two of them. We haven't been able to clone them yet. So it's uh, limited to Massachusetts and to more of the East, Eastern part of Massachusetts, but they still travel quite far. I believe Deb's clocked 500 miles last week on her, on, in her car. So uh, going to see patients in their homes as an add-on to clinics, not in place of clinics, but just to help uh, make sure that if there is a treatment that we're trying that's not helping the symptoms or causing a side effect or something is progressing that we don't, don't know about, that we're there and we can help uh, in any way that we can. Another way to do this is through telemedicine and virtual visits, which is something that I think the whole world got a lot more experience in, in the past year and a half. And we were able to use this even more uh, when there was a public health emergency. It's a little bit more limited now because with law, the laws, we have to only do video visits with people that are in a state that we're licensed in. So I personally am only licensed in Massachusetts, though there are providers in our clinic are, who are trying to get licensed in other states, especially the New England states. Um, it's become a little bit more difficult than I think we anticipated getting licensed in the other states. Um, but we are trying because telemedicine is such a fantastic way to connect with people and have conversations and see what's going on. It's, I will absolutely love seeing people in their homes. It, it brings a whole new light to the conversation. And there's also, lastly, Patient Gateway, um, which is a messaging system. It's actually linked to your medical chart, and it's how you sign into the virtual visits if that's something that you can do. It's been hugely helpful uh, to, as a way to communicate with people and for you to be able to have access to your medical records. You can see the notes that we write. You can see your medication list. You can help update your medication list and we get alerted on our end to make sure that everything that we're seeing is completely up to date um, so that we know about you and can best help you. Uh, something that has been newer since the initial rollout of Patient Gateway is there's also healthcare proxy access. So if you have a spouse or a parent or a child that you are helping uh, with their medical care, they can provide you access um, so that you can write to us directly without um, having to, uh, against the rules, use, know their password and log in. It can be completely okay and you can write to us um, with their permission. They can do that within Patient Gateway now as well. Thanks, Jen. Um, we're going to transition to um, some updates on COVID-19. And so I'm going to um, discuss this for the rest of the presentation in addition to other research updates. Um, so just, you know, along the lines of clinical care and research care, um, as everybody on this call very well knows, we're still in a time of COVID-19. Um, in our clinic and research center, we're very proud to say that you know, we've been able to continue to see patients, continue to keep momentum moving forward in the research world, and we remain very committed to keeping our community safe, each other safe as team members and staff members, as well as our patients and our general MGH hospital community. So there's ongoing safety measures and policies in place, and these are always evolving and changing depending on the latest guidelines and um, infection rates. Uh, but some of the things that we have implemented now, both in the research world and in the clinical care world, in terms of staffing, um, we are required anytime we come on site to Mass General to complete a COVID pass. So we have to attest that we don't have any symptoms of COVID-19 before we head into work every single day. Um, as you guys may have seen on the news, there's a vaccine mandate for the entire MGB community. So any employee who works in the hospital system um, had a deadline this past month to become vaccinated. Um, for extra protection and adequate protection. 
Um, we also um, continue to have a universal mask mandate for both staff members, patients, visitors who might accompany patients to visits. You might see in the clinic, depending on the types of testing that we're doing, like a breathing test or certain procedures, we might put on additional layers of um, PPE protection, like gowns, um, face shields or goggles. And then um, just to update everybody coming into the hospital, we do still have a visitor policy in place. Um, what's nice now is that with the vaccines coming through, um, they, in general, the hospital is allowed to have um, a patient bring a visitor with them for any outpatient appointment. So we're able to see um, folks with ALS and their caregivers or their um, one, one or two or one family member or um, friend accompany them to the appointment. And we did just want to put in a plug while we have you to be sure to get your COVID-19 and flu vaccines. Um, flu season is, is coming upon us. We want to make sure we don't forget about that. There's also a flu vaccine mandate for employees as well, so we can remain protected. And if you ever have any questions about boosters or vaccinations, we're more than happy to talk to you about that in the setting of your clinical care as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, um, what kind of systems and strategies do we have in place to make sure that we're integrating clinical care and research care both together, because we want to make sure that if we engage with uh, someone with ALS, either through a house call visit or a televisit or an in-person clinic visit, that if you're interested in research or want to learn more about our research and clinical trials, that we offer you that opportunity. And that anybody who comes to us and says, I'm interested in participating um, in ALS research, we give you every opportunity to, to access research as much as you like. And so um, our team is very uh, fluid in this, in this process. So um, what's been really great is that many of our clinicians in the ALS clinic, our doctors, our nurse practitioners, our nurses, our care coordinators, um, are also involved in clinical trials. And so there's a lot of overlap in our team members between the clinical side and the research side. Similarly, if somebody comes into our research center for a trial participation or a study visit, um, we work really hard to make sure that we're still connecting them with their clinical care team. And sometimes your research nurse is also your clinic nurse, which can be a great way to make sure that we stay aligned and we're supporting any changes in symptoms or um, changes in therapies while you're here for the research visit in the clinical world too. So there's a lot of systems that we have in place to keep patients connected and their families with ALS research. Um, and so all of these are in an effort to make things streamlined and very efficient for you. Um, and so one of the big ways that we do that is through our email blast. So if you go through, this is just a screenshot of our website, masterminal.org slash neurology slash ALS. And if you click on this starred link here, it'll allow you to sign up for the ALS link. And all you have to do is just fill in a little information in your email address, and that automatically adds the person to um, a database where whenever we have a new trial coming down the pipeline or an update on results or a research study, we send out a big blast to everybody so that you can stay up to speed on the latest and greatest information that we have for you. Um, in the clinic, uh, we also provide research brochures. And so um, we have brochures that we update regularly with the research coordinators on currently recruiting trials, um, not just interventional or drug studies, but also our biofluid studies, our digital trials, our imaging um, programs, so that every aspect of research is covered and you have literature that you can take home with you too to go over as you learn more about the trials. And um, Judy's name has been dropped several times already in this symposium, and I'm sure it's not the last time, but Judy Carey is our research access nurse. And so um, Judy's role, and, and Judy is working with a team of people now to help engage patients so, um, and connect them to clinical trial opportunities so that if you come in again and you're interested in research, we can refer you over to Judy and her team about a particular trial to work on pre-screening and recruitment and connect you with that specific research team. Um, another overlapping role that we have in our clinic is our research coordinators. So many of our coordinators that lead and um, ensure our protocols are carried out safely and effectively in our clinical trials world also rotate in ALS clinic. So it's, it's been great because uh, the coordinators can engage with patients in clinic on recruitment or talking to you about the different trials that they're working on. And then it also gives them an opportunity to participate in your clinical care. And many of our coordinators, like Jen said, are future nurses or physicians or researchers in the field. So it's been wonderful to have a growing team there. We also try to stay engaged with you through events like this um, online or through Zoom. We have a series of webinars. I believe the platform trial team has weekly webinars now where they're giving updates to patients and families. 
And our website also keeps an actively enrolling trial list that's frequently updated. So many ways that we can keep you connected with research. Also in the research world, we talked a lot about our multidisciplinary clinic and the team-based approach that we have there, um, but we have a similar team-based approach in the research world too. And um, what I, I'm really proud to be part of this team, and I think one of the um, biggest sources of pride for us at the Healy Center is that we we try really hard to foster a community of collaboration in the research world through um, translational research, or what a lot of people refer to as bench to bedside, so that if there's a lab in the US or in the Boston area or an academic center or a drug company that comes to us that we can engage with them and help talk to them about research, help be part of clinical trial design, help give feedback about what challenges do our patients face when they come in for research? How do we best support and engage patients in trials? And so um, through those collaborations, we're able to create a number of different types of research programs here at our center. And so, um, you know, one of the biggest foundations of clinical trial work is the biofluid biomarker studies that we have. So if you come into clinic and say you're interested in research, a lot of times we'll try to engage you in, you know, can we take a tube of your blood or a sample and bank that in our tissue repository where we can share it with labs across the world who are trying to develop new therapies or understand more about the disease or um, develop a biomarker to better track the disease or understand how it works. Um, we also engage as as we all know, in phase one through three interventional studies, um, expanded access programs, which we've talked about. We also have digital studies, and that's another great way to get involved, especially in the clinic. Um, we have research coordinators who are helping to run trials where we're, we're using iPhone apps or devices, again, to track symptoms over time in people with ALS as a potential marker or way to understand how the disease works. And then um, always engaging in ways to design trials more innovatively, like the platform trial, or like the Centaur study that Dr. Paganoni spoke about, and uh, continue to engage in an efficient pathway of trial recruitment and getting patients connected to every research opportunity that's available. So how to stay connected with us, just to kind of wrap up this, this part of the presentation, um, we welcome any and all questions that come our way. And so the patient gateway is a great way to stay connected clinically. Our website is a great way to also get more information about the clinic, but also stay engaged in the research side. Um, so please continue to use these two resources as much as you like to reach out to us. And we want you to reach out and stay engaged and um, happy to take questions as well as things come down the pipeline. And thank you very much, everyone, for listening, and I'm um, happy to send it back over to Dr. Barry. Jen and Sarah, thank you so much. <clears throat> really, I mean, um, sort of the integration of, of care and research is, is such an important part of, of, of how we try to approach this and, and, um, and sort of how we see it. So thank you so much for, for talking about, about that and about all the sort of innovative care that we try to bring to the clinic, really driven by, you know, what we hear from, from people with ALS people at our clinic. Um, we have um, a few minutes now for, for question and answer, and then we're going to have a short break. Um, we, we may run into that break just a couple of minutes, because I do think um, we want to answer the question. As I, as I said in the, in the chat, um, we have a, just a really uh, super question in the Q&A, and, and I'll summarize it. And then, as I said in the chat, I may, I may ask Merit to, to weigh in first, and then and then see if others may want to weigh in as well. And, and um, it's, a, it's a great question, one that actually, you know, sort of keeps us up at, at night a little bit. Question is, is it possible that we may have already tested via trial or an ALS drug, um, something that worked in a subgroup of people, but overall looked like it, it didn't work in the trial? Um, and because some of those subgroups of people, for example, bulbar onset, rapid progressors, slow progressors, may have small numbers, uh, may that have just, you know, is it possible that we missed that? Is it possible then to look back at some of our data and try to pick out something that may have worked in a subgroup? Um, and then even beyond that, is there some way to, to leverage either the platform or another existing um, uh, sort of mechanism to test those? Um, really good question, really difficult one um, that, as I said, sort of keeps us up at, at night sometimes. Merit, do you want to uh, maybe start with that question and, and others can, can chime in afterward? Yes. 
It's a great question. And um, I think our, our biggest um, challenge is really knowing how how to pick out these uh, responders if, for example, there is a small subset. Um, and and I, I think we were all hopeful that, you know, something like norofilament or there might be some fluid biomarker or something like that that might be able to tell us uh, subgroups that might respond um, you know, better than others. But um, so we're definitely going to be looking at this in the platform trial. We have all sorts of analyses set to look for uh, subgroups. But I, I think for the field, you know, we don't have the tools yet to be able to do it well, but we, there's certainly a lot of, lot of uh, people funded to, to develop those type of tools. Any, I, I can, I'll add a couple of things and, and maybe, you know, um, uh, anyone else on, on the panel is, is welcome to, to weigh in as well. I would just say um, Answer ALS is a project that we ran to kind of try to correlate some of the biology in both induced pluripotent stem cells and motor neurons made in, in a Petri dish from those stem cells. Uh, this is essentially taking blood from people with and without ALS, making, that, making those blood cells into stem cells and then making those stem cells into motor neurons in a Petri dish to study. Um, and that one of the purposes of that study was to try to look for biological subsets that may underlie clinical subsets. So a clinical subset may be someone with bulbar onset disease or someone who has slowly progressive disease. Um, or mostly upper motor neuron disease, and, and see whether, we, whether that correlates to a biological difference. And if it correlates to a biological difference, maybe some of the things that we're attempting are more relevant in some than the other. Coming out of some of that work is, is some really innovative research uh, in conjunction with Answer ALS, as well as with New York Genome Center, saying that maybe, maybe things like neuroinflammation, excitotoxicity, RNA dysregulation, which are, we think are happening in everybody, are happening to, to varying degrees, and we might be able to group people by those biologies. If that's the case, we may be able to go back to some of these, these previously tested drugs and really, in a logical fashion, try to make sense out of what's happened or, or, or test them again in, in, in reasonable subsets. But we're not there yet. I just think it's a, I think it's a great um, approach. Anyone else? Okay, it's a fabulous question. We do have time for more questions uh, sort of at, at, near the end where we'll have a few more presentations. Why don't we take a, a brief break, let people, um, you know, uh, stretch, um, uh, you know, do whatever they need to do for just a couple minutes. We're gonna come back at um, 2.15, so, so about seven minutes um, and, and, uh, and then we'll reconvene. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to start up after a, a short break. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it's just been remarkable so far to, to just, you know, hear about the, the clinical results we've heard about, about the, the biological results we've heard about, um, and, and the plans going forward, as well as how we sort of bring all of this into the clinic. Some of what I'll talk about will harken back to things that you've heard about already. Um, uh, uh, and then hopefully we'll give sort of an overview of the landscape. I will say, I'll share my screen in just a second, but I will say that I'm going to talk about a lot of information about trials that are going on and, and upcoming soon at the Healy Center. Um, this is not the kind of presentation that you're going to get every detail of as it goes by. Um, I think if my goal for you to take away from this is really how incredibly exciting the trials that we have going on are, the ones that are coming up are. There are opportunities to participate in trials. And then I'll go over some of the resources that you've already heard before about how you can sort of find out more and get involved. And, and, and so, you know, if, if every jot and tittle doesn't, doesn't stick, that's okay. Um, I'm gonna share my slides here. I'm gonna... Let's see, I'm gonna share my slides here. 
Give me just a minute. All right. I'm James Berry, um, and I'm at the, the Healy Center. Um, have the great joy of working with everyone who's spoken so far, as well as Katie Nicholson, who speak after this, um, and others at our center. We have an incredible group of people. It's 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 really one of the joys of of, of being there, as well as sort of getting to work with people with ALS, like all of you on the phone and, and others who can't be here. We are recording so that people who couldn't be here today will still have an opportunity to, uh, to see the presentation. The first trial that I'm gonna talk about is the, the Healy ALS platform trial. Merritt gave a, a really wonderful overview of how important this is for the community and for um, people with ALS to connect to these incredible opportunities we have from sort of coming from industry, many of these ideas. Um, and, and how we can move more and more quickly through all of the promising therapies that need to be tested in trials. Um, the, this is the same figure that Merritt showed. I wanna walk you through it briefly as we talk about you know, enrolling in clinical trials and, and what does that mean? So the first step would be to screen for the platform trial. And once the screening process is done and somebody's included in, in the platform trial, then they're assigned to what we call a regimen. Each regimen, is one therapy that we're testing. And we are fairly simple-minded, so we give those regimens letters because that way we don't have to say the name of each of the drugs when we talk about the regimen. So right now we have regimens A, B, C, and D, and those correspond to the drugs that are being tested in those regimens. Um, once somebody is assigned to a regimen, then they're randomized within that regimen. And that randomization is done at a three to one ratio. And what we mean by that is for every three people who get, uh, who are, are, are placed on the active study drug, only one is exposed to placebo, which is much preferable to what we used to do, which is more of a one-to-one -one randomization. So that's one of, the, one of the sort of real benefits of this platform trial. Regimen A is uh, called Xylucoplan. Xylucoplan is an anti-inflammatory and it targets something called the complement system. Regimen B is a drug called Verdiprostat. It also targets inflammation, but in a very different way, targets something called myeloperoxidase. It's a different uh, sort of branch of our immune system, a very different sort of uh, a mechanism, but again, targeting neuroinflammation. Regimen C is CNMAU8. This is a catalyst, it helps energetics flow. So it, it boosts the sort of energy utilization within cells, um, and uh, which we know is, is abnormal in ALS, by the way. And then uh, regimen D is perdopidine. Um, and perdopidine uh, sort of improves uh, the mitochondrial function. You might remember that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. So through a, a sort of complex uh, approach, um, it acts on, an, on, a, on a receptor and, and improves the cellular energetics in a way as well. Um, because of the incredible um, you know, uh, sort of community efforts behind this, the trial got up and running quickly, but it's also enrolled incredibly quick, quickly so that um, these, uh, these regimens are either completely enrolled or nearly completely enrolled which is incredibly exciting because that really starts the clock ticking for when will we get the results from these. It's a six month trial. So the randomized portion is six months for each of these. And then that's followed by what we call an open label extension. And what that means is that no matter what people were randomized to for the first six months, they get, ex they get exposed to the actual, they get to take the actual study drug from there on out. So the really exciting thing is that we get closer and closer to getting results um, and the other really exciting thing about the platform trial is that it is set up so that we will add regimens as we go. So regimen E is coming soon. That is uh, a drug called Trelahos. Trelahos helps uh, with something, the formal name is called autophagy. What Trelahos does is help cells take out the trash. So there, it, we know that in motor neurons and people with ALS, we see accumulations of proteins that have become sticky and they clump together and the cell doesn't do a very good job of getting rid of those clumps of proteins. And that's kind of the trash of the cell and we need to get it out. Trelahos helps those cells clear out the trash. That's a weekly infusion. Um, and you know, we're, we're really excited to, to, to get started on that. And, and it, it just shows the power of, of the platform trial. 
I think I would say, you know, at least what we had expected, if not more. <clears throat> so we'll be enrolling. And when I say enrolling soon, I say, I would say within, you know, within, within months to months. Um, there are other ongoing trials at the MJ Healy Center that people with ALS can become involved in. So uh, another one is with Novartis, big drug company. The, the drug being tested here is BLZ945, really rolls off the trunk, uh, rolls off the tongue, that one. This is a phase two trial. Um, drugs often have letters and numbers before they get names. Um, it's an open label trial. What that means is that everybody uh, has the drug. There's no placebo. The target of this is, again, inflammation. And in this case, the idea is to reduce the activation of a cell type called microglia. And microglia are one of the major immune cells in the brain and spinal cord. And we know that they're activated in, uh, in ALS. And Suma Babu, uh, as I said earlier, has been leading some of the work to be able to image those activated microglia. We're using some of those imaging techniques as a biomarker in this trial so that we can see whether the drug is hitting its target. Really exciting. Um, early phase trial. Again, just to remind you, trials start at phase one. That's the first time they go into people. They then ex extend onto phase two, which are often biomarker driven trials or smaller trials. And then phase three is the last trial where we say, okay, does it, does it slow the, the disease progression or do what we want it to do? Rapa Pharmaceuticals uh, is testing a product called Rapa 501. I can't call it a drug because what it really is, is, is cells. These are, it's called autologous regulatory T cell infusion. So autologous just means it's from the person who's being treated. And then I'll talk about regulatory T cells for, for just a moment. So our, our immune system is made up of a number of different kinds of cells, B cells, T cells, monocytes, there are lots of them. But there's, there's one particular kind of cell called a regulatory T cell. And the regulatory T cell's job is really to tamp down inflammation. So when inflammation starts, that's often a good thing. We often need inflammation to fight off a, a, an infection. But when that infection has gone, we need to quiet down the immune system. And that's what regulatory T cells do. We know from uh, studies of blood, these biomarker studies that, that uh, Sarah Lupino talked about that we do in our clinic, um, we know that regulatory T cells are lower in people with ALS and that there, there is a dysregulation of the immune system. And so this is an attempt to restore those regulatory T cells. We take white blood cells, those are the immune cells, from people with ALS, we isolate the regulatory T cells, we expand those T cells, and then we give those T cells back by an IV infusion every four to six weeks. This is a phase one study. Again, it's open label, first time in people. We have done other T cell studies, but this is the first one for this product. Um, and so we're, we're very hopeful about this and in the midst of enrolling and following people for this, for this study. We have a number of ongoing ALS trials targeting specific mutations with antisense oligonucleotides, which we'll, I'll just call them ASOs. That's our shorthand for them for, for reasons you can understand. This is the same technology that Suma talked about in her talk, um, but they can target various different genes. And so uh, there's one trial, again, these actually the three trials I'll talk about here are, are um, from Biogen. The first trial targets a gene called ataxin 2 ATXN2. ATXN2 appears to be a risk factor for ALS. This is a phase one trial. It's actually enrolling people with ataxin 2 mutations and a few people who don't have those mutations. They're relatively uncommon. Depending on whether people have a mutation or not, it's randomized two to one or three to one drug to placebo. And the goal here is to decrease ataxin 2 protein, which we think will prevent TDP43 toxicity. So when I talked about those sticky proteins in cells, Sticky protein, the, the most common sticky protein uh, in the cells of, of people with ALS is TDP43. It takes on a central role in the, in the biology of this disease. And this will come up in, in some of the other trials as, as well, um, that we're sort of in some way or another trying to manipulate TDP43 to either prevent it from clumping together and getting sticky or get rid of it once it's, once it's there. So really, I think exciting biology there. There's another ASO trial for people with C9-ORF72 mutations. We sometimes call this C9 ALS. It's the most common mutation um, that, is, that causes familial ALS. 
This is also a phase one uh, study. It's randomized three to one. Uh, it's really targeting that C9 mutation to reduce uh, this, the mutated C9 in the cell and the, all of the, the things that go along with that, which are sticky proteins, problems with TDP43, problems with energy metabolism, uh, and a whole host of other things. So it's really trying to get up to the very top of the, of the pyramid. So all the things that kind of go wrong after that don't go wrong anymore. Again, phase one trial. And then the third one is something that's really novel for a number of reasons. It's called the ATLAS study. It is targeting SOD1. In fact, it's using the same ASO that, that, um, that Suma talked about. There were complex results from that study, but one thing that did seem clear uh, is that if we can treat people earlier and longer, we seem to have, we, we probably have the best chance of success. So all the positive um, hints, all the wonderful biological data, biomarker data from that study, we think will be even more effective if we treat earlier and earlier. And so what this study is doing is enrolling people who have the SOD1 mutation, but do not yet have symptoms and following them so that either when they begin having symptoms or when their neurofilament begins to increase, they can be treated with the antisense oligonucleotide and we can really get to the very start of the disease and, and, and have the best chance for success. So I think really, uh, really exciting novel design, uh, you know, building on the results that we've seen already. There's another study that's ongoing that's, that's targeting C9 ALS. This is from Elector. Um, the drug is called AL001. It's a phase 2A study, so still, still fairly, fairly early, but not the first time in people. It is randomized. It's an IV therapy. It's an antibody. Now, again, it's really targeting this sticky TDP43 protein. We sometimes call those aggregates. But it's not targeting TDP43 directly. What it's doing is increasing another molecule called progranulin. And by increasing that molecule, trying to reduce the sticky TDP43. So we're taking lots of different approaches to try to get at that central issue in, in, in ALS. Um, now, there are also a number of trials that are coming to the, to the MJH Healy Center and will be enrolling soon. One is the Amelix study, called, uh, which is a phase three trial called the Phoenix trial that Sabrina talked us through earlier, randomized three to two. Um, this is Tudka and sodium phenylbutyrate, also known as AMX0035. Um, Tudka, <laughs> there's lots of naming things here. We'll call it AMX0035. Um, and the target here is oxidative stress and inflammation and probably other things that are going wrong in the cells, in, in, in the cells uh, as well. So really excited about that. You know, Sabrina walked us through kind of all the, all the wonderful uh, sort of details of that trial earlier. Cytokinetics is carrying on development of a drug called Reldeceptive. It's a phase three trial that they're planning. It's called Courage ALS trial. This is an oral drug. It'll be randomized two to one study drug to placebo. The target here is a little different. The target is to try to increase muscle strength. And it does that by binding to troponin, which is inside muscle cells um, and increasing calcium, which increases how much contractility or strength the muscle has. And so strength measures are an important uh, piece of, 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 that, uh, of that trial and of that whole sort of reasoning. So we're excited to have that on the horizon. Calico has a phase one study of an oral drug who has so many letters and numbers that we won't even say it. Um, um, this is a four week randomized study with 40 weeks of open label extension. So a brief period of time randomized and then everybody will have a, uh, access to the drug after that. This targets something called the integrated, integrated stress response pathway. It's basically how cells respond to stress. And again, it's really getting at TDP43 gets aggregated and clumpy and sticky in times of cellular stress. And so we're going to try to head that off. Um, and, so, and so yet another approach to really the central thing that we think is going wrong in, in ALS. Baricitinib is a drug that's actually on the market for rheumatoid arthritis. This is a study that's being led by Mark Albers, who's a colleague at, at Mass General Hospital. He really um, came across a whole new pathway that has to do with inflammation. It's relevant in Alzheimer's disease and ALS. And so we're doing what's called a basket trial here. A basket trial allows us to study two diseases at the same time, in this case, Alzheimer's and ALS, 
with the same drug. And there are some complexities in designing that. We've spent a long time really getting this to work. We've had to pull together a number of different groups. We have various outcome measures that we're looking at. I think it's a really exciting approach. It's used in oncology cancer research a lot because it's a very efficient way to screen drugs across diseases um, and, and, and uh, you know, potentially find that it works in all of them or, or maybe in a subset of those diseases. So really exciting. This will be open label, 24 weeks of treatment. We call it a phase two trial. The reality is this is an already approved drug. Um, we will have to have our eye on some key uh, you know, potential adverse events. Um, so, so that's also very exciting and, and on the way. We have four genetic ALS trials starting up at the Healy Center. AI Therapeutics is uh, doing a phase 2A study, so an early study, randomized two to one with an open label extension, really targeting uh, protein aggregates in C9 ALS. By aggregates, I mean other kinds of sticky proteins and, and buildup of proteins in C9 ALS. Transposon, also targeting C9 ALS, targeting neuroinflammation in a really, really amazing biology. There are some over the millennia, viruses have left little pieces of their DNA in all of us. So all, some, for some percentage of our DNA, as much as five to even 10% of our DNA comes from viruses that have over millennia infected humans and left little bits behind. And it's sort of targeting those pieces of, of DNA to keep them quiet. And there's a little bit of evidence that this could be useful. So really novel biology, phase two study, um, excited to get going with that. Um, Ionis uh, has another ASO, which is targeting a, a gene called FUS, F-U-S. And so for people who have mutations in the FUS gene, this can reduce uh, the, those FUS, the expression of those FUS mutations, and we hope make a dent in that disease. And this actually is you know, an incredible example of an expanded access program that has grown into a full trial. So really excited about to, to, to take part in that. And lastly, APIC Bio, which is testing a virus delivered gene therapy for SOD1. So it's just like the ASO, the idea is to reduce SOD1 expression, but in this case, we use a virus. It's very much like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for COVID, which is a virus, compared to the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines, which are, which are um, analogous to the ASOs. They're not ASOs, but they're analogous. So to have all of these sort of very targeted biologies coming, and this is something that was just science fiction a number of years ago. And then on the horizon, we have trials from Denali and Sanofi. And I'll tell you that there are, as Merritt said, there are hundreds of companies that are looking into ways to, to uh, test their drugs for ALS. It's a whole different uh, sort of road ahead of us and an incredibly exciting time to be, uh, to be doing this. This means that we have more, more studies than we've ever had before almost orders of magnitude more studies than we've ever had before, and certainly orders of magnitude more people in these studies, which is incredibly exciting, but we also need to expand. And so Doreen Ho has joined us. She is an experienced neuromuscular and ALS physician, an outstanding patient-centric approach to care. We know this from knowing her, but also from speaking to her patients. Um, she's a dedicated clinical researcher and a respected medical ed educator. Um, and we are incredibly excited to, to welcome her to our team. I'm going to pause here for just a second and stop sharing my screen. Um, Doreen, do you want to just say a, a few words? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Dr. Barry. Um, my name is Doreen Ho. I'm, I think, the newest member of the team. Um, I'm extremely grateful and excited to be joining this team. and and to partner with all of you in this community. Um, I was actually a fellow here at, at Mass General Brigham about a little over 10 years ago, um, the same year as, as uh, Dr. Barry. And um, for about 10 years, I've been um, you know, developing clinical programs in neuromuscular diseases at Leahy and also um, engaging in clinical trials. And here at the Healy Center, um, I'll be working with the team in the clinic hoping to develop educational initiatives for the residents and fellows as well. And of course, working on the platform trial and other trials. So it's an honor and privilege to be here and I look forward to uh, meeting many of you. Thanks so much, Doreen. We, really, we are just incredibly excited to have you.
So I'm going to end with, um, again, I told you that there would be a lot of information. There was a lot of information. Uh, we're managing this by expanding our team, um, you know, bringing Dr. Ho on, but also expanding the coordinators, our number of nurses, you know, really ramping up so that we can do all of this faster than ever uh, and, and take advantage of this exciting time. Um, so we need a way to organize information for, for you and for us. Um, Sarah Lupino talked about the MGHALS link. Um, you can follow the web link here. You can also Google Healy Center, MGH Healy Center, MGH ALS Clinic, and it will take you to this landing page. So you can sign up for the link. My guess is many of the people on the call today are signed up for the link. We use the link to, to advertise these, um, you know, these meetings that we have. Um, you can also review trials at the Healy Center on the webpage. And in fact, we even have implemented a, a a button that says I'm interested when you expand and get some information about this and that'll send a, a message directly to our coordinators so that they'll have your contact information and can reach out to you. Um, if you're interested in the platform trial, we have something called the platform trial participant interest form. Uh, if you point your smartphone at that QR code, it will take you to the web page. Um, but you can also navigate to this through, through our, our website. You can also just do a search engine search for Healy Platform Trial Participant Interest. Um, lots of ways to find this. Um, it'll give us some information so that we can then contact you and, and sort of get that, that pre-screening process going. You've heard Judy's name a number of times. You know, the, the research access nurse is a position that, again, a number of years ago was not important because we had a trial uh, if we were lucky and we would just tell people about that trial and, and, and decide whether that worked for them. Now, as you can see, the landscape is not only um, burgeoning with, with studies, but also targeting those studies to particular, um, you know, people with particular genetic makeup um, uh, or, or particular biologies or particular interests. And so I think having a person to guide you is really, really important. And, um, it, you know, we, Judy embodies that role and does more with it than we, we ever could have imagined when we just thought of the role. And we're incredibly lucky to have her. And, and, and I encourage you to take advantage of that. We also have patient navigators for the platform trial, Catherine Small and Alison Bulat, and they are more than happy to talk about people about sort of the best way to enroll in the platform trial, whether you're close to the Healy Center or not close to the Healy Center, because there are, there are 54, soon to be 72 sites around the country uh, participating in that trial. Uh, and they're, they're more than happy to get you there. And they're also happy to talk to you about other research if that doesn't feel like it's gonna be the right option for you and get you to the right place. So um, again, this is the thing about having just an incredible team is that, is that we, you know, we really are, are we're here for you. Um, I, having an acknowledgement screen is, is difficult because there are just so many people working on this, but I, I just would get across the point that this is all, everything you've heard about is a team effort and we are um, incredibly um, dedicated to, to making this work and, and we have a, a really good group of people uh, working, uh, working together. So I'm going to, uh, I'll finish there. There's time for questions uh, in um, um, uh, sort of at the end of the next talk. Um, in addition to the work that we're doing on clinical trials, and you heard embedded in one of those clinical trials, a novel design to follow people before they develop ALS, um, we're beginning to think about, you know, how might we understand the very, very beginnings of ALS and how, how might we leverage that to understand genetic forms of ALS, but also sporadic forms of ALS uh, and, and have better ways to target um, uh, ALS as a result. So our next speaker is Dr. Katie Nicholson, um, an assistant in neurology and, and an instructor at Harvard Medical School. Um, and she is gonna talk about Prevent ALS, which is really a bold, a bold uh, new initiative. Um, uh, let's see. I, I, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm wondering. We're getting enough questions that I, I do wonder whether maybe, gosh, after my introduction of Katie, I wonder whether we should pause and and, and take a few questions now. Sure. Um, and then, do you mind if we do that, Katie, just so that we don't we don't let them go too long? All right. 
So I'm gonna read a couple of questions off of the Q&A and then either I'll answer them or, or I might have to pass them along to, to others. So um, the first question is, is there a particular trial geared toward progressive bulbar palsy? Um, at this point, we don't have one directed specifically toward progressive bulbar palsy. I think when we think about trials, it may influence which of the trials makes, you know, makes the most sort of sense to enroll in. So some of the trials are IV medications, which may, may be easier if someone's confronting swallowing problems. Um, as far as biologies, you know, one of, I mentioned answer ALS um, as a, a project before this was a thousand people who were enrolled and we're, we're really asking questions like, do people who have bulbar onset disease have a different biology that we should be targeting differently? Right now, we don't have that information, but we're, uh, you know, I, I hope that we will soon. Um, progressive bulbar palsy generally uh, would allow people to enroll in, in other trials and be eligible for, other tri for, for all of the trials um, that I've talked about. Next question, of the trials that are targeting an immune response or immune-related inflammation, such as complement inhibitors or baricitinib, is it possible that someone with ALS and an autoimmune disease like lupus, psoriasis, vitiligo, et cetera, would be more likely to be a subgroup of responders? And would someone with these autoimmune diseases possibly benefit more than just a heterogeneous population? That's a very good question. First, I would say that there is interesting data saying that people with ALS are a little more likely to have autoimmune disorders than the general population. Um, and that's sort of a hint that the immune system is a little bit dysregulated in ALS, and we have lots of data showing that. Um, the, the short answer is I don't know the answer to that. Is the immune system more dysregulated in someone who has an autoimmune disease and ALS? Uh, perhaps, is it more dysregulated in a way that would make the ALS more likely to respond to an immune-mediated um, uh, therapy? I think we just don't know the answer to that, but that is something you know, we collect information about concomitant diseases, and that is something that um, over time we could potentially have the power to, to look back and, and study. We don't know that right now. Um, Current trial drugs for sporadic ALS are intended to slow the progression of ALS. Are there any near future drugs that are intended to halt or maybe even reverse the progression of sporadic ALS? Um, so we, we design our trials to identify, uh, to be able to identify drugs that will at least slow the progression of ALS. And we, you know, there's some statistics that go into saying how many people do we have and how long do we need to follow them? So anytime we're looking to slow the disease, we're more than happy to see it halt. <laughs> um, so, so when we talk about wanting to slow the disease, we're sort of talking about the minimum bar that we're looking for. Merritt, did you want to comment on this one as well? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely. I think the closer we get to the um, cause of the illness, you know, for example, like the gene therapies, but even in sporadic, as we understand more and more about the biology, I think more likely those drugs would be able to, um, you know, do the things that we all want, like halt and reverse. The other thing I'd say is that there are um, now scientists and companies working on um, repair, you know, like someone repair, how do you reconnect the, ac the nerve axons, the muscle, um, and they're not that far away. So that, you know, but still you have to, you have to stop what's causing the problem, but, but it's exciting to me that people, you know, that there's scientists working on the repair part too. Yeah, including including at Mastro. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And and as we get closer to that central biology and being able to 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 uh, to target that, I think this will become a more and more important thing. If we, you know, if we say, okay, now we can really target that central biology. Now, how do we how do we make things better over time? I'll also point out that you know we know from polio, you know, paralytic polio is a motor neuron disease. It's just a, an infectious motor neuron disease and, and it halts. And after it halts, we know that some people have a fairly good recovery of function, maybe not entirely, um, but there's something to be learned there as well. And, and that's something that's been studied for many, many years, obviously. So um, we have some leg up there. These are great questions. Katie, I apologize for the false start on your introduction, but we're still just as excited as we were a few minutes ago <laughs> to, to hear what you have to say about Prevent ALS. Sounds great. Thank you so much, James. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. 
Excellent. So hopefully you can see my screen here as well. And let me just move this to the side. Wonderful. Um, so thank you so much for um, having me speak today. Um, welcome to all of our patients and families on the call. Um, some familiar uh, names and, and names that um, uh, I have yet to meet, but um, certainly I'm excited to talk to you more about a new initiative um, called Prevent ALS. Now, our understanding of ALS may be just the tip of the iceberg. The key to unlocking the cure for ALS may be just below the surface in people who are at risk for developing the disease. We're partnering with a whole new population. Support from the patient community is very strong, and people from families that harbor ALS causative mutations tell us that they are very highly motivated to help. This is a partnership, and the more partners means we have more data and bigger discoveries. Now, familial ALS or inherited ALS represents about 10% of all ALS. However, when we reframe our focus on all of the family members of people with these inherited forms of ALS, the number balloons to equal the number of people with sporadic or non-inherited ALS. Disease prevention is also our most powerful tool in medicine, and probably the most recent um, example of that is the big push for a COVID vaccine rather than just a COVID treatment. Now, this initiative, Prevent ALS, has a vision. We envision a future in which we can halt ALS biology and prevent the disease, not only in people with ALS-causative gene mutations, but also in people who would develop sporadic ALS. Early diagnosis and treatment is key. This is a bold initiative with big goals. We need to stop or halt ALS in its tracks before it begins. Like a house fire starting with a single match strike, ALS begins in one area and then spreads. Imagine the impact of blowing out that match before it can ignite the, the, the whole house fire or better yet, removing the matches from the house entirely. The first job for Prevent ALS will be to find where the matches are kept. In other words, we don't yet know what the earliest disease markers are, but we are on a mission to find out. Now this Prevent ALS initiative has several goals. We will be working with people who are asymptomatic ALS gene carriers who are at risk for developing ALS. We're going to be following their clinical signs and symptoms to assess for the earliest changes and follow uh, biomarkers or markers uh, such as proteins in different biological fluids to assess for the earliest biological signs of disease. Separate studies are currently accomplishing these goals on a small scale, and the goal of Prevent ALS is to really align those efforts together and to expand those efforts. Now I wanna show you some uh, data from our pilot study, our pilot program, uh, which started in 2017, which Dr. Barry and myself run at Mass General in conjunction with Dr. Timothy Miller at Washington University in St. Louis. This initiative, this pilot initiative is called the DIALS or Dominant Inherited ALS Network. And currently we have enrolled over 150 participants and uh, are rapidly growing. So again, these are people who are asymptomatic, um, but carry a gene um, that is known to cause ALS. Now I wanna take a moment to talk about biofluid markers of interest in early ALS. And I know you heard from Dr. Babu a little bit about uh, neurofilament um, in the uh, Tofersen results presented earlier. Neurofilament is released when motor neurons undergo damage. It's not specific to ALS and in people who are healthy, neurofilament is normal. We know in people with ALS or PALS, neurofilament is elevated and remains relatively stable throughout their ALS journey. The degree of elevation appears to correlate with either fast or slow progression of ALS. And there is discussion of potential use of this marker um, for discussion of prognosis in clinic. It is just starting to be available in clinical labs, although it's unclear if it's consistently covered by insurance. And this is certainly something that you can talk about with your ALS care team. Now, what I've shown here in the figure on the right 
um, is from uh, one of our collaborators at University of Miami who runs a similar study to dials called prefalls. And they followed several pre-symptomatic gene carriers, seven individuals who had um, the SOD1 um, gene and one individual who had the FUS gene. And these individuals were without symptoms and developed, unfortunately, symptoms over time. And what they saw is that the neurofilament started to rise approximately one year um, prior to symptom onset. And symptom onset in this figure is indicated by this vertical line. And this was found both in the blood and in the spinal fluid. Um, so let me show you some early dials re results from an analysis we did um, about two years ago. We're about to look at this data um, in a larger group of, of, of participants um, shortly. Um, but what you see here is looking at um, a number of individuals who harbor the C9 or 72 or C9 mutation who developed, unfortunately, symptoms over time. Um, and what you see here is uh, the results from the spinal fluid on the left and the results from the blood on the right um, with the vertical line um, at zero indicating the point in which they developed symptoms. What you see here is one individual who had a more fast progressing disease um, who um, had a very high neurofilament level. The individuals um, on the lower register in both red indicating they developed C9 related ALS and the individual who developed C9 FTD had a lower neurofilament level. And these individuals um, have a disease progression on the kind of more moderate to average side or the slower side as well. And what this shows us here is neurofilament may not uh, show us the whole picture in people who might develop ALS symptoms soon. So this just highlights the urgent need to evaluate additional biofluid markers in a higher number of people at risk for ALS. And that's what we're doing right now. We are actually looking um, at the uh, biological fluids uh, donated um, by um, all of the participants within the DIALS program to look at neurofilament, again, a marker of um, neuronal uh, damage over time, something called chitinases, which indicates involvement of uh, cells that support upper motor neurons, we're also looking at the gut microbiome and inflammatory markers and immune profiling with different cells that indicate um, uh, uh, aspects of the immune system. Um, and here is uh, another set of results as well um, from our group. Um, again, this initiative was supported by ALS Finding a Cure um, in which uh, we looked at uh, the gut microbiome in people with ALS versus healthy controls. And we were what we found is that ALS patients have an altered gut microbiome. Um, and what you see here in the uh, figure on the left is that there were a number of different bacteria here indicated by red that were um, statistically significant in terms of an increased amount or uh, abundance in people with ALS. And then all of these bacteria indicated in blue were decreased in a significant amount um, in people with ALS compared to healthy controls. And what we found when we tried to group these uh, different types of bacteria together is that um, some of these bacteria, um, a, a large number of them, produce something called butyrate, uh, which is a short chain fatty acid that is neuroprotective. And that is decreased as a group of butyrate producing bacteria in people with ALS versus healthy controls. So we're very interested in, in discovering when does this change start? Um, so not only are we, are we going to be looking moving forward at the gut microbiome, inflammatory cells, and immune profiling in people with ALS over time, but also in people within the DIALS and PREVENT ALS programs to see when these immune changes start in ALS and if we need to um, actually treat um, these changes um, with directed therapies, um, perhaps earlier in the disease process or even when people don't yet have disease, but maybe have evidence of that biological change. So Prevent ALS is an ambitious program, really building on the successful foundation of the DIALS network study. Um, our goal would be to ultimately expand to up to 10 sites and up to 1,000 participants. And we want to align with leading familial ALS programs and labs into a consortium. We want to work together in this common goal. Um, not only will, will we be bringing together the DIALS program at MGH and WashU, we'll also be uh, joining efforts in an alignment with uh, Columbia, University of Miami, University of Massachusetts, and Cedars-Sinai as well. Uh, we want to incorporate key lessons and resources from 
other studies that you've heard of and, and James just mentioned, such as ANSWER ALS, that incorporated large amounts of data together in a very successful way. And we want to employ these really novel approaches to uncover new targets of disease and really facilitate translating these findings into ALS clinical trials rapidly. Um, so this is exciting. We'll have new collaborations in Prevent ALS for very impactful discovery. Uh, with Bob Brown seen here on the left, we will be identifying genes that modify ALS disease onset and disease progression and really promoting rapid development of of therapy that modifies disease at UMass. We wanna also work with Clive Svensson at Cedar sinai seen here on the right, to create a dedicated stem cell core to bank these uh, stem cell lines for all prevent ALS participants at Cedar sinai and bringing that together to use uh, stem cell modeling um, of people who do develop disease over time from prevent ALS to really identify what are the environmental risk factors that are important, not only in people with in inherited forms of ALS, but also to prevent sporadic ALS. And we want to characterize these gene environment interactions for all people with ALS. Now I wanna take a moment and really focus on the potential impact that this initiative could have on sporadic ALS. We know that the data thus far strongly links together genetic and sporadic ALS or inherited and non-inherited forms of ALS, it is highly likely that the insights from Prevent ALS will translate to sporadic ALS and that modifiers of when people develop the disease or disease onset in genetic ALS are likely to be risk factors for non-inherited or sporadic ALS. And the earliest affected pathways are likely to teach us the most impactful therapeutic development focus for sporadic ALS. And biomarker changes will help define these early abnormalities. It may actually help establish earlier di diagnosis in sporadic ALS. And we all know how long sometimes it takes from symptom onset to diagnosis. We would like to shorten that time frame. All in all, if we do the study well, we, we may be able to prevent sporadic ALS, which is very exciting. And finally, uh, we envision a future in which we can prevent ALS. Gene-directed therapies, as Dr. Babu presented earlier today, are very promising for ALS treatment. And we can use existing and novel tools to understand ALS biology and prepare to prevent ALS. We'll start by understanding genetic ALS and then translate those findings to all of ALS. And studies like DIALS show that we can do this. And it really is the partnership with um, families that have been affected by inherited forms of ALS. And they are so motivated to partner with us and help. Aligning these studies creates synergy and power. And if we think and act big, we believe we will be successful. And I, I wanna uh, thank everyone here on the slide, most notably the participants of the DIALS program. I know we have several um, who have joined our, our call today. So thank you so much. Um, and all the families as well who have supported our program. Thank you so much, Katie. <clears throat> really, really um, you know, compelling, compelling study and very well presented, I, th I think. Um, and it really kind of makes it, makes it clear. Um, and I, you know, I have to say we've been working on this for a long time. You know, you've enrolled really, um, uh, you know, over a hundred, approaching hundreds of people, and, and I think we're we're beginning to see the fruits of that, and we're we're you know we're gonna um, learn a lot. We have one question in in um, uh, in the the chat that I'll I'll maybe ask you, and and I'll ask all the panelists to come on camera. Um, and then, you know, we, we can answer this and we could also answer any other questions if people are typing them in. Um, so this came in, okay, while, while you were talking, um, but so we'll give you first crack, but if, if anyone else wants to weigh in as well. Um, a protein SP110 suppresses the expression of SOD1 phenotype in dogs with a canine version of ALS called uh, degenerative, canine de degenerative myelopathy. The mode of inheritance in dogs is autosomal recessive, yet dogs with both copies of the mutation don't express symptoms of ALS or, or this degenerative myelopathy. Has anyone explored the impact of SP110 in humans with familial ALS, especially asymptomatic carriers of various mutations? It's a great question. I, I, 
I'm not familiar with it myself, but um, maybe you are. So sure, I can take a crack at it. Um, so to my knowledge, this is a has been a helpful tool as a uh, another animal model of, of ALS that has been helpful to test drugs that may not necessarily be specific to this protein. Um, but um, for example, we have uh, several different mouse models of ALS and SOD1, um, C9, um, TDP43 as well. Um, this is a, a similar model in a different animal um, and has been helpful um, as we um, try to understand um, how we can uh, better translate between animal models and, and humans um, to have successful translation of positive findings in animals. To my knowledge, I don't believe there is a study that is um, uh, like a gene therapy that is targeting um, this particular gene. Um, to my knowledge, it is more a useful uh, animal model, but I certainly defer to others on the call. Yeah, I, so I, I don't know SP110, but I will. we will be asking about it. Um, and, and, and there's also kindly a... Um, a link to the article about it. And Joan Coates is one of the senior authors of this. Joan really helped define canine degenerative uh, myelopathy. Um, I have been involved in some research with her. She's a fabulous veterinary researcher, uh, really, really has given us incredible insights into this. So, uh, you know, but I, I just wasn't familiar with SP110. So thank you. Thank um, you. Um, there is still time for people to answer questions, um, uh, uh, or pardon me, ask questions that, that we're happy to answer. I might um, go around and just have people give a, a last, you know, a last thought before we wrap up um, while we're waiting for some questions. Um, let's see. I'm going to go in the order. Katie, I'm going to give you a break <laughs> because you're first on my screen, but I'll go in the order on my screen and then come back to you, Katie. Um, so, um, Merritt, do you want to do you want to start with just sort of closing thoughts? Uh, uh, yeah, I think if Kevin also always uh, asked us to put uh, from ALS one one word there, and, and uh, I'll say that my one word today is is just progress. There's just so much uh, progress going on in this field, and it's a real honor to to work with um, all the people with ALS that we know from our clinic, but also the people we've met through social media. I feel like we're a real community that's trying to make the difference here together. And I, I've never been more hopeful now, than now that we're really going to be finding meaningful treatments um, for people with symptoms. And then also, like Katie said, to try to prevent it in the first place. Yeah, that's great. So we'll, I, I love this idea that we'll, we'll lift the idea from Kevin Gosnell and ALS1 that we'll have sort of a one word, one word closing. And um, with great thanks to him and to, to ALS1. Um, Sabrina, you're next in, on my screen. Um, uh, uh I had, I had to think, think of the one word in very quickly, uh, and I had to say, if I, you know, but that's good uh, because really what comes to mind, uh, you know, what surfaced in my mind was partnership. Because if there is one thing that's good about the pandemic is that we've been communicating with all of you, quite frankly, more often uh, through virtual means. Uh, obviously, I would love to do this in person soon for whoever is available in person. Um, and, and local. Uh, however, I have to say, I do appreciate the fact that now we are connecting with so many people from everywhere. At this point, geography is no longer a barrier. Uh, let's continue to connect and to partner, and we welcome your ideas and feedback. I really love having the weekly webinars as well as, you know, this um, ALS one day, your day, um, and, and, and other um, webinars to connect. So thank you for your partnership. Um, so I was muted, but Jen, you're next on, um, on my screen. I didn't want to assume, but <laughs> um, I would say that my, la my final word is engagement uh, with each other, with uh, different sponsors and industries creating drugs, with people with ALS and families, with other providers. I just feel like the engagement is at a real high, um, and it's incredibly exciting and providing a lot of hope. Suma, you're, you're next up. All right, we're, we can't hear you, Suma, but you don't appear to be muted, weirdly. Oh, can you hear there me you now? Go. Yeah, that's Okay. 
I was I was going to say that I concur with all the words that uh, others have mentioned so far. And I'll add my word uh, for the day as persistence. Um, drug development for ALS is a long journey, and there are hurdles along the way. It's not a smooth ride uh, every single time, but uh, we've got to be persistent and 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 keep going. And we will uh, reach that infliction point and find treatments soon. Thanks, Emma. That's great. Sarah, you're next on, on my list. Sure. Um, I would say the word that's coming to mind for me is gratitude. Um, I, I think, you know, and I finished my talk and I meant to highlight this. I'm just so grateful to be part of this team, but also um, for all of our patients and um, people with ALS who are engaging in research. We truly couldn't do any of this work if it wasn't for you all and for everybody who's on the call today and um, everybody that we have the honor to and privilege to interact with in the research and the clinical setting. So just thank you, everybody. Great. Katie, it's back to you. I have the, 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 the tough kind of last, last position. I have to come up with a good word. Um, I feel inspired by all of you who have spoken here today, and most importantly, by all the patients and families who've joined us. You are the reason why we um, get up and, and go to work every day and, and work so hard to cure this disease. And so I want to thank families and patients um, tremendously for your inspiration to us. Fabulous. I, I, um, I suppose I have, I have not said my word yet. So I, I'm, I'm a little stuck between uh, two words. The first word is hope. And, and I, I'm incredibly, I'm filled with hope, not only by the things that we talked about, by, but by the people that I get to work alongside um, who are here, but also so many others who are not on the panelists, but we work with every day. I, I'm, I'm incredibly filled, filled with hope. And the other one is, is momentum. Um, and because, you know, I, I think hope is, is, we have absolute reason for hope, but, but in some ways we have reason for more than hope because we have momentum and we have successes. And we've been doing this now for seven years, but to come into this with talks prepared to show positive trials and show trials that are building on those positive trials, that's new. It's new. So we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. We're still looking forward to being back in person, um, uh, but, but it's been a lot of fun to present. And uh, thank you to everybody for being here. This is one of the most meaningful uh, days of the year for us, uh, which is why we're looking forward to having it in person. But we'll also find a way to incorporate people um, who have a hard time being there in person as we've done in the past even when we get back to being in person. So thanks for being here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.